morning and welcome to the first of Tuesday sessions for Leasehold Knowledge Week. This morning we're going to be discussing using drones to better understand your block and I will be joined by Group Managing Director Julian Davis of Earl Kendrick and Adam Bailey, Director from Earl Kendrick Digital. Quick thank you to our sponsors, BBIS Commercial Heating, JPC, Towergate Insurance Brokers, PLP Fire Protection, Foresight, Realty Law, Blackguard Insurance, Chandler Harris, and pearly gate maintenance. Now, to give you a little bit of a background on our experts, Julian became a member of the Royal Institution of Chartered Affairs in 2004, working for seven years largely in the residential sector. In 2010, he founded Earl Kendrick to build a team of talented surveyors to serving a wide range of clients across the country. He is recognized as a thought leader for the property industry and is bringing his invaluable experience to a wider audience. Adam, a building surveyor and photographer who has been a leader in the use of technology and innovation within the property and construction sectors, has set up Kingfisher ASP PS in 2013 to provide drone surveys to the built environment and was the first in the UK to do so. He has built a reputation as the expert working with aerial drones in complex and challenging locations, particularly in compact central London. Since 2014, he provide, provided Earl Kendrick with professional drone services, and in 2020, he and Julian Davis teamed up to launch EK Digital. So our presenters will be taking questions throughout the session, so please use the Q&A button in the middle of the screen. And I am now going to hand over to both Julian and Adam, who are going to run through this uh, great topic with you both in detail. So good morning, Julian and Adam. How are you today? Very well, thank you, Charlotte. Good, good. Right, uh, I'm going to, without further I'm just going to hand back straight over and let you get on with your topic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, as Charlotte has introduced us, um, we'll, we'll just go quickly back over who we are and uh, why we're presenting today. So, you know, move on to our first slide, which is basically introducing EK Digital. Um, EK Digital, as Charlotte said, um, was previously Kingfisher APS. Um, it's a business I set up back in 2013 to provide drone surveys to the built environment. At the time, I was a property block manager and we had some issues with accessing roofs, um, many of which were inaccessible and couldn't be viewed by traditional means. And the only solution at the time was scaffolding, which was costly for leaseholders and difficult for block managers to get in place. Came up with drones and ever since been using them for inspection works of property and construction. Um, and we'll touch over the technical uses of that later in the presentation. Um, so for eight years, um, we provided that just on uh, a supply, supply basis to L Kendrick, who you know, we worked on a contractor basis with. Um, and it was a very strong relationship. And as such, um, Julian and I um, came together and decided that actually it was time to create a joined up company and EK Digital was born in 2020. Um, we saw that was demand for this. And now we can provide that full uh, service with the strength of knowledge of El Kendrick behind us. And if, uh, so you've had the introduction about myself um, and Julian, so I'm gonna hand over to Julian so he can talk about the principles of building maintenance, which leads into the uses of drones in this sector. Yeah, thanks Adam, yeah, good morning everybody. Um, I think before we, we start talking about the, the drone technology, you know, Adam's gonna talk about the regulations and um, I mean, the main thing we're gonna talk about today is, or, or, or sort of go through is, is case studies, you know, what, what can we achieve by using drones? How does it help us as surveyors, you know, end users, clients, yourselves as, as property managers, et cetera. But the backdrop to um, what we're here to talk about today is really, is really simple, you know, build, building maintenance. And the key point here is that all buildings deteriorate over time. Um, and that may sound obvious, 
but you know countless times we we have you know people clients coming to us saying well it's a, it's a new building you know it doesn't deteriorate it's a new building doesn't need maintenance but you know all buildings deteriorate um, and that's the building structure the building elements and we're talking about the roofs the windows the finishes um, you know even a brand new building quite often some of the warranty and guarantee provisions for things like roofs will uh, necessitate regular inspections so perhaps annual inspections um, you know uh, inspections every couple of years um, I spent you know loads of time over the years talking about the importance of planned maintenance and ensuring that if you're managing a residential building that it's got a comprehensive comprehensive plan maintenance program um, and that plan maintenance program obviously has to adapt to the changing um, circumstances the changing um, you know conditions and as we've all gone through in the last year I think a year ago today was the, the first day of lockdown uh, you know we've been through covid um, and that's applied restrictions it's meant that uh, buildings are not getting the same level of inspections uh, major works building maintenance projects have certainly uh, reduced um, you know we haven't in the last year we haven't got uh, to site as many projects as we normally would given the issues with um, you know labor in the industry just a, a general reluctance to embark on, on spend and also uh, some difficulties with um, you know perhaps elderly residents in buildings um, etc cetera, etc cetera. the other issue that we've been facing in the last well probably more than a year actually is is um, cladding and fire safety and it's been a headache for, for most, um, although I say it's a headache, it's obviously one of the most important things that we do, but it's certainly diverted time, energy, focus away from perhaps general building maintenance projects. So there's a large focus on um, cladding remediation that we're all, you know, all, all aware of and perhaps most of us are involved in. But again, what that's meant is that the perhaps general maintenance projects you know, cyclical external decorations have perhaps been put on hold, perhaps been delayed until this, you know, um, this, this, this cladding and fire safety um, project has, 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 uh, has progressed. Um, and I know from experience that quite often it's the, it's the minor defects, the minor maintenance issues that if they're not addressed, they will progressively worsen and turn into significant issues. So when we're talking about plan maintenance, what we're really focusing it on is looking out for the underlying issues that might lead to problems down the line and really identifying those issues before they um, become uh, you know, serious, uh, serious problems. So um, what we've used, particularly in the last year, is, is the drone technology. I mean, there are other types of technology that we'll touch on today when we're talking about digital surveying. Um, but as Adam said in the intro, we've been using drones, you know, with Adam for the best part of 10 years, just under 10 years. But the, I guess the uh, rate at which we've been using them over the last uh, year in particular has been exponential. Um, we'll go into a few case studies, but using drones will obviously allow a closer inspection of quite often what are hard to inspect areas of the building. Uh, we can mobilise drones very quickly. Uh, there's a saving on cost if we're comparing a drone survey to abseil, scaffolding, and even surveyors' inspections. You know, even if we are able to access roof and difficult areas of the building, often that's a, a time-based survey, particularly if we have to arrange access into flats. Um, we may need two surveyors to go to site for health and safety reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So we're we, we're using drones hugely to, um, you know, to, to mobilise quick and thorough inspections at, you know, what is often a low relative cost. Um, and really, the purpose of all of this is, you know, no different to traditional building surveying. All we're interested in is looking after the welfare of buildings to preserve, you know, their function, their um, economic value, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's the backdrop of, of what we're looking at. And I'm going to hand over back to Adam now to look in a bit more detail about what drones are, what are we talking about, and you know, the regulations surrounding uh, this technology. Thanks, Julian. So if we move on to the next slide. So what are drones? So I'm not gonna assume that everyone knows what a drone is. Um, 
A drone is, uh, in essence, a flying machine. Uh, and we're talking about drones that carry cameras. Uh, Julian, we've seemed to flip back on some slides. Um, so you'll see a picture there of one of the drones that we use. Um, I've got a couple of drones next to me as well, which I'll pick up and use as examples throughout. Um, this is the camera, if my background allows it to be shown, um, that is held underneath that drone. Uh, different drones can obviously achieve different things. They may have the same outputs, but um, they will be to different quality and to different degrees of complexity and outputs. And they, they'll be used in different scenarios and for different cases, uh, use cases. Uh, they are in essence, a flying tripod. Um, they're a means of carrying a sensor. In the main, we're talking about um, cameras, um, RGB cameras, much like you'll find in your phone or your SL, traditional SLR. You know, that the drone itself is a means of carrying that. Now, there's lots of sensors within the drone that help them stabilize and position. And sometimes that data is embedded in the photographs and help us in specific ways. Um, and that technology is ever increasing and improving and sensors are getting bigger or more compact. Um, there's more data within the drone that's um, provided within that data information as well. But also the drones themselves are changing, the technology is moving forwards. So what the drones we used to use when we started out were very large uh, with multi-rotors, um, six of them and they looked like it'd been built in a shed, which wasn't far from the truth. And now they've become very compact, very advanced, and they look very different as well. Um, I am talking in the main about multi-rotor drones, which are ones that have propellers and spin, much like the one in the photo, but there are fixed wings as well, but they tend to be used more in land surveying and large corridor surveying rather than buildings. And obviously, we're interested in buildings, so I'm going to talk about these types of drones. Now, you know, they've advanced a long way, so we've got a little drone like this, which I will talk about later. Yeah. Varying in sizes, as we say. So the, the technology itself is ever improving um, and changing, but in essence, it's the same thing. It's a means of getting a sensor somewhere that you couldn't necessarily do safely or adequately in the past. So we're going to move on a bit from there. So that's the introduction to what drones are for those of you who weren't aware. So drone usage in the UK and development of the industry. So drones have been around for a while now. Um, it's still a very young nascent industry. Uh, as we said, I, set, I first set up a business using drones in the UK in 2013. And back then there was a there was a hundred or so commercial operators in the UK using drones for various amounts of things, but mainly TV and film. Um, at the time I was in property management and I thought I can use these to inspect buildings. Now that photo there is actually one of our original drones. As you can see, it has that look of a uh, home built um, Heath Robinson about it. And um, that was actually really advanced back in the day. Um, we got flight times of about eight to 10 minutes and we thought that was amazing. Now we're getting flight times of 20 minutes plus, um, which actually is quite a long time for a drone to be in the air. And that timeline time is actually increasing as well. But drone usage in the UK is growing at an exponential rate. There are more and more use cases that are being found for drones um, and they are being deployed in different ways and everyone Obviously, when we talk about drones, things drone delivery, you know, things like that are things that are being developed in the future. And when we talk about the regulations in a second, that kind of makes a bit more sense. Um, but there are growing usage usages for drones because they provide a safe and easy means of accessing areas that were previously very tricky or unsafe to do. So if we compared them against traditional means, um, of access, you know, scaffolding is limited to specific areas and physically 
impacts on the property. You know, it costs a lot and take months to put in place. Access platforms are a quicker, cheaper way of doing that, but again, very limited access. And even with uh, cherry pickers and the like, you're limited to where they can go. You know, the cost is is a bit lower, but again, positioning permissions and leading times can be weeks. And abseilers, abseilers are great um, because they can get their hands on um, and they can take samples or take out small repairs. But again, they're very limited to where they can get on the buildings. And you're putting workers at high risk in a high risk environment whereby you might not need to. And the, the drone is a robot we can put in those, those areas to make it safer. Um, you know, it's important to consider though those aspects of safety and getting to areas um, that would otherwise be limited because of those issues. And that is why we're seeing a grown, growing use of drone usage. And the industry has grown from a bunch of guys who and girls because who who are using these to do limited things to to be more uh, progressive and the, with the increasing technology and the development of the drones themselves we're seeing a development of more sophisticated uses of drones and within the surveying area especially uh, it's drones being used by people who've got more understanding of the outputs and the, the reason for the use of the drone because everyone has access to a drone in some form and it's about understanding why you're using that and you know, there's a development here that it's not just someone flying a drone and being told how to use it. It's understanding the, those various elements of it. And that's why the usage of the drones themselves is growing and development of the industry to become a more professional one is growing. And that leads us on to the regulations uh, because uh, actually we're going to come back to the regulations. I mean, We've got to look at the specific use cases for drones first and I'm going to hand over to Julian in regards to that because he can give a an outside view of the specific use case for drones and why they're they're very good especially in the the built environment. Yeah thanks I mean I, th I think what we'll do is obviously cover a lot of this in the in the case studies where we can show the, the use in context but um, the way we're, we're really using drones is um, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, plan maintenance program, so we can do a, a, a good overview survey of roof areas, high level masonry areas, chimneys, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So areas of the building that were quite often not accessible, um, assumptions would be made in the plan or sort of recommendations for, for further investigation. So um, certainly plan maintenance programs. Um, we're using drones quite often for clients who just want to understand their portfolio. So large estates, uh, we're working with a property management organisation at the moment who have a number of large sites and they have asked us to undertake a drone survey just so they have a visual record of the high level areas of their building. So, you know, looking at balconies, interfaces, uh, roof materials, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really more of a sort of record. So to understand um, understand the building. Um, we're using drones for water leak investigations, dampness surveys. So again, um, you know, we're often asked to investigate dampness, uh, water issues, you know, water ingress issues. Uh, whereas before, if we, you know, if it, an example of a top floor flat, um, we couldn't get onto the roof. We may make assumptions of what the cause is. We may then uh, suggest scaffolding is erected, et cetera, et cetera. Now with a drone, we can fly over that roof area um, at a low cost. Are there any defects? You know, quite often we're able to identify things like missing roof tiles, broken roof tiles, um, defective pointing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think over the years, as the quality of the imagery has advanced, you know, these drones now use very high quality um, definition cameras so we really can see a lot of detail so I always used to say you know it's never as good as a surveyor up there poking around at flashings but actually when you think about the logistics the health and safety issues and now the quality of the image that you can see I think my view is, is you know is, is, is changed on that it's much better to, to get a drone up there fly a drone around initially and, and sort of pinpoint the, the obvious issues if there are any 
Um, I think we're using drones for measured surveys. That's a bit more specialist. Adam will touch on that uh, later on. Um, we're also using um, 360 cameras on drones. So it's not just a sort of static video or um, you know series of images. We are now using 360 uh, cameras on these drones, which means that we can then uh, go into the images, interrogate them, move around, um, you know, add, add notes on those on those images, um, etc. Um, and then, you know, cladding. We're also using drones for, for things like cladding inspections. So, um, you know, what's the condition of the cladding from a ground level visual inspection? Even getting into flats and floors, you can only see so much of the external building fabric. Um, we've got a client at the moment who's got a, a tower, you know, residential tower, and they are in the process of assessing the next phase of external maintenance so what is needed on that building um, so we have uh, well we're in the process of, of, of flying a drone because what we can see is you know what's the condition of the sealants that are used on the building so you know fa fairly minute details what's the condition of the surface finishes on the steelwork which again from a ground level inspection you know very hard to see so we can get a lot of detail to help us put the kind of outline scoping document together um, before we either do further investigations or, or go to the full specification. So um, as I say, we've got a, a quite a few case studies that we'll go into to, to sort of explain this in, in more detail. Cool. Yeah, just to add to add to what Julian was saying, you know, on why using drones, we, we're looking at them as a cost effective uh, solution. Uh, they allow um, they allow block managers and leaseholders and leasehold management companies to use their resources correctly. Um, you know, you record those findings and easily shared with leaseholders and other stakeholders to show the, the reasoning for making decisions. Um, especially, you know, under things like Section 20 and that you can you can show your reasoning and you can show the, the reasons that you've come to come to those conclusions. Um, just got a question come up i'm going to address the questions towards the end if that's all right brett um and we'll, that will be one that i will that i will address at the end so what i'm going to touch on now is the regulations because it's one of the things that everyone needs to have a general awareness of when instructing any kind of drone operation um, but also the fact that the regulation has changed, which has uh, in a way opened up the space to a certain extent, but it's opened up things for the future and it's changed the way that drone operators approach things and the way that the industry is actually led. Um, so I'll give you a bit of background. You know, the Air Navigation Order is a legal bit of legislation enacted by Parliament and it states on how air use is managed and the regulations around it, not just for drones, but for all air users. Um, prior to the 31st December 2020, so as of the 1st of January 2021, we've got new regulations in place, which slightly changes. But if you were going to use, there was, if you're going to use a drone commercially, you had to have what was known as a permission for commercial operation of HIFCO. Um, and anyone who wanted to use a drone commercially and things were tweaked over over the years um, had to have a PIFCO with adequate insurance, adequate training and the like. Um, and there was a very distinct difference between commercial and recreational use. Um, and I would always refer to anyone who was thinking about using a drone operator after the PIFCO in the first instance uh, and the insurance document because then you know you've got someone who, who, was, who was undertaking the drone survey, at least legally, and then you can look at the safety aspects of it afterwards. So that was the back, and the, the main things that we were looking at were people, vehicles, vessels and structures, PVVS, and restrictions around how you could fly your drone in relation to those. So there was a rule called the 3050 rule, which meant that any person, vehicle, vessel or structure that was within 50 metres of the drone when it's flown has had to be considered under the control of the person operating the drone. Um, that's still 
in essence in place, but we'll, I'll, I'll update that in a second. Um, and we thought of it as a bubble around the drone. So if the drone was in the air, 50 meter bubble around that drone, anything within that 50 meter bubble had to be considered under the control of the drone operator. That reduced to 30 meters at takeoff and landing. So 31st December 2020, and we have the introduction of the new regulations, which are now based on risk, not on whether you're making money from, from using the drone or not. I mean, this is how, it, how a lot of us operators have always felt that it should be. Um, I'm not gonna go into full details, but there is full guidance on the CA website if you want it. Um, look for a document called CAP, that's C-A-P-722, and that will go into a lot more detail for you. Um, basically, this has turned the drone, now this is a term I don't like using, but I will in this, in this instance, the drone industry into one that is more insurance-led than regulator-led. Um, and it makes drone use safer. Yeah. Two ways it makes drone use safer. The use of equipment is to be built to a CE safety standard. And the use of a risk assessment that takes into account the risk of the operation itself and the competence of the remote pilot. Okay. So it's risk based based on people and other air users. And so we see the removal of PVVS as the main driver. It's people. So we're not talking about vehicles, vessels or structures anymore, but we consider they're in the people that are in them. Um, you know, so the driver of the vehicle, the occupants of the building and those people who are around it. OK, so what the regulations did was it introduced three categories of drone operation. The, these were the open category where there's low or no risk to third parties. Um, so basic, basic predefined operational characteristics. Um, there's no authorization required for the open category and there's a really basic level of training needed for it. There's a lot of scenarios where the open category can relate, but mainly we're talking in uncongested areas where there's not a lot of people around with very small drones. Um, there is the specific category. This is for operations that are too complex or risky to be carried out under the open category. You now need what is called an operational authorization from the Civil Aviation Authority, an OA, um, which is in essence replaced the PIFCO. And the level of training for the specific category depends on the risk of the operation again. Now, there's one last category called certified category. Um, we don't really need to consider that. Um, it's, risk, it's for risk equivalent to manned aviation. So that's when we're talking about drone delivery in the future and large um, drones that carry passengers in the future. These are things that we're looking beyond the specific and open category and also for operations that are beyond visual line of sight. So we still have a visual line of sight um, rule in place whereby we have to maintain visual sight of the drone at all times in operation. That's for safety of the drone and other air users. And this is something that's carried forward as well. Um, so looking, so we're looking at the open and specific categories. Um, there are now, you know, it's under Article 241 of the Air Navigation Order. Um, you know, th that remains in place and there's, it still allows for prosecution of people who are deemed to be reckless or negligent in operating a drone. So if someone is using a drone that falls in open category or they have an operational th authorization and operating specific, if they are being reckless or negligent with that drone, it doesn't matter what's been in place. If they, they can still be prosecuted under the air navigation order. Um, there are a number of permissions still required on top of these. Um, so if you're flying close to airfields, uh, such as London Heliport or Heathrow, you know, they have what are called flight restriction areas around them. I'm not going to go into too much detail about those at the moment, but there is a lot of information out there on this. Um, then you need permission of that aerodrome to fly within those FRZs, those flight restriction zones. 
Similarly, there are a number of areas in London and across the UK that is restricted airspace and you need additional permission to fly in those. Uh, within London specifically, there are three, R157, which is Hyde Park, R158 and 159, which is the City of London and the Isle of Dogs. And for those areas, you need permission from air traffic control, as well as the diplomatic and parliamentary protection group. So those are on top of the other permissions that you might need. Now under open and uh, specific categories, there are um, three aircraft classes, um, which are based on maximum takeoff mass or flying weight, um, which are A1, A2 and A3. And they've got traditional uh, transitional subcategories as well. Again, there, I, I can point people, people to uh, more information on this. I don't want to read verbatim the regulations for you because it's quite dry and we'd be here for quite a lot longer than the time allowed for this presentation. So essentially it's based on the mass of the drone. Now this little drone here is 249 grams and under the current regulations it comes, the new regulations it comes under A1 category. Now essentially what you need to do to fly this is you need to read the manual. You also need to register as an operator ID with the CA. So all drone, all drones need to, drone users now need to register with the Civil Aviation Authority. You know, so it doesn't matter if you're flying a small one or a big one, you still have to register with the Civil Aviation Authority. Um, and for this one, you have to put, you'll see we have our operator ID on this. So we have to do that with all drones. You can't fly over crowds. Um, and although you don't need a flyer ID for it, it is recommended. But essentially, you can fly this in a lot of ways. And it's quite a capable little drone for doing things. But for surveys, the quality of this camera, although it says it's 4K, it's not great. So we, you wouldn't want to use this day in, day out for surveys. And within congested areas, yes, you can use it, but still you have to consider those safety aspects. Um, in the open category, it's no longer a bubble. It's a lateral distance. So when we're talking about distance, distances from people, we're talking lateral. So even if we were at 100 meters above the ground, we would, we would still have to have 50 meters either side of it. So you really restricted in congested areas what you could do with this under the open category. Um, and it's very limited in itself as well. And we have to keep visual line of sight of it. You know, we are still limited to 400 foot above ground level. So that's 120 meters. Um, and although we can fly this, in essence, it is a toy with a camera on it and it's limited to what it can do. So. In order to carry out surveys, we still will want to have a commercial operator. You know, this doesn't mean that you don't need a commercial operator anymore. You know, the open category is for when it's very low risk and there's no risk to third parties. Um, but for it, it's so open, open category is very unlikely to be the correct thing to be using for surveys. Um, and we need to look at other considerations such as competency, experience, professional training. And in order to get insurance to cover those, you, you, you'll be looking for an operator who has that experience and who has an OA that allows them to do it. Now, this drone here is one that we're using more and more. It's quite compact in itself. So, and you'll see the difference with the drone that sits on top. The camera difference alone is, is massive. And then if we step up to the camera we use on quite a lot of the survey, you see the camera itself. So is the size of the drone and therefore the sensor and the quality is there. You know, we can, with a professional operator, you know, we're, we're, we're being driven by our insurance. We can, uh, as standard, EK Digital carry 10 million pounds public liability insurance, but you'll find that all commercial operators carry a, a large degree of public liability insurance. And that's why, you know, Yes, the open category now allows us to do some small things, but with the operation, 
authorization, we're allowed to do a lot more. Um, and I can go into greater detail on that, but it, we are still operating very similar to what we were doing before, but we are doing risk assessments based on the risk to people and other air users, rather than vehicles, vessel, vessel structures themselves, uh, as we used to um, prior to the change. There's also some other changes as well. Um, so whereas we had a hard ceiling before of 400 foot, so 120 meters above the ground level, which kept us separated from other air users, um, there's been a slight change in that, in that we can now increase that um, to 15 meters above an artificial obstacle, such as tall buildings. So whereby very tall buildings weren't within our capability before, now we can do that and we can go up to 15, 15 meters above as long as we remain 50 meters uh, proximity to the building itself, but only with the permission of that artificial obstacle, because that still keeps us separated from other air users. And it's all about safety. So safety of other air users, safety of people in the ground. So as long as we've done our risk assessments, we've got the correct permissions from the correct stakeholders, um, we can now cover all buildings within the UK, whereas before we would have been limited to that 120 metres. Um, and there's also some changes in regards to undulating terrain and the heights above those. But again, I can provide all that information separately to anyone who's interested in that. Um, but yeah, so that is the change. You know, it's now risk-based rather than specific catch, uh, restrictions based and it's based on on the risk that the, both the drones and the operations pose so hopefully that covers that covers enough information at this point and i'd happily talk to people about what the new categories are and how those change how we do things julian anything to add on that julian no, no, that, that's great, Adam. No, I mean it's um, yeah, it's quite surprising how. I mean, I remember in the sort of you know, eight nine years ago, how big the drone was that that you were using, and it, and it did uh, did look quite scary. But now it's you know it's it's really reduced in size. So so it's always interesting, isn't it? When we when we undertake a drone survey, how much interest it gathers with yeah. um, you know, particularly if you've got uh, you, you know, people at home, it it, it still generates quite a lot of interest doesn't it so we we had a school on one survey didn't we a school next door to the site where the school children came out and and sort of watch watch what we were doing yeah um, i think the best thing then adam is, is to is to run through the the case studies and sort of put, put all this in context certainly so we've got a number of case studies here we're going to i'm going to run through what the actual um survey was and the challenges that we as drone operators um, faced. And Julian's going to put some more information so that how it helped. Um, hopefully, from the images, some of it's quite obvious, as you can see by our, our lead photo. Um, and we'll actually touch on that as one of the case studies as well. Um, but we're going to jump straight into one that is in central London as it loads. So, this overhead here is of one building of a of a group of buildings of a development which is close to Baker Street. So those of you who are familiar with London will know this is a very busy area. Now this is also comes into one of the restricted areas, um, R157 in this case. So the planning for this drone survey, although it looks quite a simple roof system on this building, um, took a lot of knowledge and input. Um, you'll see that this is another set of roofs here. So given it was a busy area, we had to look at the risks of the people in the area, how we were gonna manage that, and the risks of the people in the building. How were we going to manage the risks of people who were living in the building as they exited the building? How were we going to manage that? Um, people in cars, as they were driving and parking up, how do we manage that risk? How do we approach it? Um, you know, as with all risk, you have to look at what is adequate and what is, you know, what's the right mitigation to put in place. So we did that through um, some of our basic um, mitigations, such as signage. So we, we always have signage up on the sites that we work in. We have a highly visible team on site. So 99% of drone surveys we undertake, you'll see a team 
of people go to site rather than a single person with a drone. And we not we had all the residents of the subject buildings notified by the building manager in advance so that so that they understood what was going on and weren't concerned when they came out the building and were approached by a team. The neighbouring buildings, those that were close by, we also notified the occupants of those. And we do undertake a privacy impact assessment uh, on a regular basis to ensure that we're complying with privacy as well. Um, and the multiple buildings, obviously we had to look at the equipment we were using, what was most suitable and what was gonna get us the information as well. So that's, those were the challenges as the drone operator. Um, and we had to ensure that the surveyor was getting in the information they needed to do their report. And this is where, you know, once we've captured that data, we would hand it over to, to the surveyor. So in this case, Julian's going to be the surveyor who talks through it. Yeah, this was a site that was actually, um, so Earl Kendrick were instructed to carry out the, um, the next phase of external maintenance. So this was on, a, on, a, on an estate with a, a few buildings that, you know, the, the cycles of maintenance are undertaken at, at, well, at set frequencies, but different buildings at different times. But again, it, I think these photographs just show that it's a fairly complicated roof, um, but the access to inspect that roof in detail was, was just not available. And this was quite interesting because the client, um, I think from our early conversations with them, was fairly adamant that this block didn't have any flat roof areas, that it was that it was all pitch roof. But obviously, you know, you can see from this image, there's a, there's a large expanse of, of flat roof areas there. Um, but the detail images you can see, you know, from this, we can we can zoom in actually as well, but we can see the condition of the, the roof slates, particularly the pointing to the flashing so we can see behind those parapet walls that the render is cracked um, we can look at the condition of the um, the drainage pipes but also what this does it allows us to um, you know include the the photos the roof plan when we're putting specifications together it gives the contractors a lot more information than we would typically be able to do if we couldn't get access to this roof so it helps to define a much clearer scope of work, reduces the uncertainties, but also uh, when we're getting price, prices back from contractors, um, you know, that price tends to be more, um, I guess, tight. Um, and again, what, what, what all this imagery did, before we prepared the specification, we were able to put a presentation together to the client, to the board of directors to say, look, this is all the um, the defects that we've identified. Here's the scope of work that we suggest is undertaken. Um, we presented things like the optional works, you know, what's desirable, what's essential. And I think just having this uh, presented in a very uh, graphical report really helped to uh, educate the client what was needed, engage them, and they were able to agree with the scope of work that then we, we put into the, uh, the technical uh, specification. So we're on to the next case study. Now, this is a, an old school building in southeast London. Uh, straight away, you can see that there's some issues with this roof. There's lots of activity in this area. It's a highly compact residential area. So again, we had to consider how we would mitigate it being a busy area. It's a complex roof system. How, what equipment were we going to use to cover all of those issues and how were we going to present that data? So these were the challenges for us. On the day itself, uh, we had to, con the weather wasn't ideal. Now we always consider the weather in a build up to a survey and this was no different. Um, and we had relatively high winds on this day. So we had to use a drone that was capable within the wind speeds that were there. So, and then we had to augment slightly our approach because we had originally planned to use a different drone for this but the high quality detail and using the larger drone meant that we could cover the building sufficiently and get the detail as you're seeing in the photos um, just a question on winds might come up uh, typically we can work in our equipment is rated up to around 25 mile per hour winds um, but we always look to reduce that down to 20 miles an hour for safety reasons so that we mitigate that weather 
uh, aspect as well. High rate, heavy rain and snow as well, you know, any kind of heavy precipitation. It's not going to be great because this is a visual record of the building. So any water or moisture on the lens and on the building is not going to be ideal. So those are our two main uh, risks with weather. And we have to, again, plan plan for that. And we do that well in advance. So even with a small survey, there'll be lots of planning and time spent on preparing for that survey. Julie, anything to add on the, the score? Yeah, there? I mean, this, this one's fairly self-explanatory, but what, I mean, what the drone footage uh, gave us was obviously we knew, or we, we suspected, or we, yeah, we knew the roof was in poor condition, but as you can see here, there were a lot of uh, slipped and broken tiles that were on flat roof areas. And because of the vantage points available from the ground these these were not you know you can you couldn't see this so um what what the drone enabled us to do here obviously assess the condition of the roof but also identify you know what we consider to be fairly urgent health and safety issues those tiles need to be removed to prevent them um blowing falling onto the onto the footpaths below um so i think i think the rest of the photos are, are self-explanatory there so uh, this next uh case study this is a large converted warehouse in the Liverpool docks area. Um, and as you can see, it's very tall, very large um, and quite inaccessible for any kind of traditional survey. So the drone was almost um, a given for surveying the roof of this building. Um, it is in the Liverpool docks area, so that provides its own uh risks that we needed to look at and mitigate before going to site um within areas such as this uh, winds tend to be slightly more uh, prevalent and we had to look at using the right drone in that respect maintaining visual line of sight of the drone was always going to be a challenge so using a drone that we could get sufficient distance from the building to maintain that visual line of sight when we couldn't get all around the building um, and maintain the quality of detail that we could get. So we can start flicking through those slides. You'll see we, we were doing the elevations, we we're doing the roofs, we we're doing the upsteps. So it's getting that detail. So there's limited access around the building. And one, one a natural risk that we always have to consider, and this is becoming more prevalent in London, um, where they're becoming more aggressive, is uh, birds, and in particular seagulls. Um, they're not particularly happy when we fly into areas that they're nesting. The London seagulls at the moment seem to be particularly aggressive. Um, I don't know why that is. Maybe they're learning something from the locals. Um, but we have to consider that we might come up, up against them and what our mitigations are with wildlife, uh, especially certain times of year when it's nesting and hatching season. We know that they're going to be quite aggressive. So coastal areas and uh, dock areas and the like we have to consider that we might come up against them and maybe program a, the survey for a period after or before that season which unfortunately runs a lot of the time through summer um, but in this particular instance we were lucky with seagulls and the weather was at least for part of the day very suited to undertaking the drone survey and we were able to cover all areas you know the upstands the high level tower areas such as this and provide a lot of information for the surveyor. So again, I'm gonna hand over to Julian just to put some input on that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, on this one, I think what, we, what we're able to see fairly quickly is uh, clearly or clearly crumbling masonry, you know, areas of the copings that, that need to be uh, repaired, but also uh, it's not that easy to see, but we could see quite a high, um, a high proportion of what we call well inappropriate repairs to the high level masonry so areas where bricks had been refaced uh, sections of the cornice have been refaced so you know not replaced but they've been almost cemented over and we know from experience that those poor repairs don't last very long they're susceptible to crumbling so this photo doesn't show it very clearly but we were able to identify just the extent of inappropriate repairs that will probably cause large problems quite quickly. Um, I mean, there's an area there, a photo there that shows that, that this gray sort of liquid applied membrane, again, you know, we would never have been able to see that from the ground. 
um, or sort of, you know, and, and we could see the types of repairs that have been undertaken to this building in the past. So we can build up a good picture of the, the sort of history of how this building's been uh, maintained. So I've just been prompted that we've got eight minutes left. So we're going to actually fly through the next ones. Um, you know, the challenges of them, you know, that one there that we just skipped through was a flat roof in, um, in Pimlico area. Um, you know, it's in restricted airspace. There's lots of sensitive buildings, consulates there. And it's a good example of a flat roof survey. And the reason we were using the drone for a flat roof survey was there was no man safe system or edge protection in place. And so we were able to cover it safely and quickly and cost effectively. And you can see some aspects there. The next one uh, is a large development in Chelsea, and it was a large development. We were covering the roofs, the upper elevations, and some of the challenges we had with that was uh, the multiple different types of roof systems. Um, part of the estate was adjacent to rail, so we had to seek permission from Network Rail to fly close to their assets. And there's a lot of residential activity there. It was also in London Heliport's FRZ, so we had to engage with the London Heliport and get their permission for flying in their airspace as well. Um, so I, I think we're just... Yeah, this, this was an example, wasn't it, of, a, of, an, of an estate which is predominantly low maintenance, actually. It's a fairly new build estate. Um, and this was a good example of uh, using drones to enable the client just to understand the detailing and extent of the sort of high level areas. So you can see on this shot here, there's some internal balcony areas. There's some enclosed terraces. Um, and if you imagine if we were having to go into all of the residential flats to inspect these balconies well a it wasn't possible because of covid but also the time it would take the logistics the disruption so um, what this survey allowed us to do was present the client with um, a report that showed that whereas the buildings generally were fairly low maintenance up to the parapet level above the parapet level there are actually quite a high number of repairs that were needed so pointing of coping stones repointing of flashings and it was identifying quite a large package of maintenance that um, I think the drone surveys allowed us to well we're still in the process but allowing us to develop a scope of work that will um, have a tailored access methodology to ensure that the work is focused on the areas that need it you know not just putting scaffolding up on the whole building for the sake of it but actually minimizing the scaffolding putting up towers to um, only access the areas that, that require the maintenance. So given we've now got five minutes left, we're just gonna skip through the images of the next ones, but you can see you know, damage and stuff, and there are some complexities around airspace and managing the risks of these as well. So that one particularly was in Preston. This one was in West London. Um, and we just get through these images, you can see the access and the areas that we get and some of the things that we, we saw on those um, nice chimney pot screw. This last one is an example of the technical uses, 3D modeling um, using drones, a technique called photogrammetry. Couldn't get a laser scanner on there. And the developer, you know, this isn't residential, but we have done this on the residential properties as well, but this is a good example of it. You know, we got accuracy of sub 10 millimeter, which allowed a roof plan, 2D roof plan to be drawn accurately for re -roof, for stripping off and re-roofing that, that building so that the works could go ahead with full knowledge and quantified works so that um, a budget could accurately be put together. That's all the case studies, unless Julian wants to add anything to that last couple of bits there. No, that's all, all from me, Adam. Cool, so um, we're just gonna move on. I've got a few questions. Uh, I've got three questions at the moment, one in the Q&A and two um, on the chat. So I'm gonna, gonna go to Brett Williams first because he, he asked a question earlier. The question was, um, how often do you need to arrange for a building surveyor to undertake a traditional high level inspection after a drone survey has completed? Or is it that the traditional inspection is now completely removed? Um, I think there's, there's two, two answers to this basically, Brett. The first is just for a visual survey and a report on the condition, et cetera, we don't need to go back at all. 
it's when further investigations are needed um, that then we may need a surveyor to physically get on a roof. Uh, the drone is no panacea for getting your hands on. So if we need to do sample testing or lift materials, that's when the uh, that's when the drone is limited. But to get an understanding, a visual understanding, and a record and report on on the condition of those areas, then we don't need to subsequently put anyone at height or at risk, and we we don't need to revisit. Julian, concur with that? Yeah, I mean, I think the only if we if we use that high level survey of the, of the large estate and, you know, that gives us an understanding of what's needed. If those repairs are done, then, you know, five, six, seven, eight, maybe 10 years later, then, you know, flying a drone around again to sort of look at the rate of deterioration would be suitable. But I mean, we have used drone surveys in a re in a in a in a relatively short time frame where we've got issues like falling masonry. So you know, tall buildings, you know, perhaps a Docklands building, we've identified loose masonry, a package of abcell removal works have been undertaken. And then the drone may be used, you know, one, two years after that to again check for um, issues ahead of the sort of package of, of major works until those issues can be addressed um, properly. Um, I mean, we're using a drone this week for a schedule of conditions. So there's a building, a large building, where uh, the site next door is being developed. A large construction site and the client understandably is concerned with damage dust from the building site so we're using a drone to take a very high definition uh, schedule of condition of the outside of the building um, and we'll use a drone again either in the interim or at the end of the construction site next door to check if any damage or dust um, has, has you know has occurred so that's something where we would we would use drones um, you know re re repetitively so we've got two more questions, both from Trevor and Kurt, and I'm going to um, just quickly go over those because we're into our last minute. So does relative humidity like rain affect the drone if you can fly most drones? Is the industry developing waterproof drones? There are some IP rated drones out there, but um, they're very specific use cases. If you're doing, as I mentioned earlier, it's a visual survey, even if you could fly the drone in really heavy rain, you're not going to want to because it's going to affect the quality of your outputs. Um, but yes, there are some IP rated drones and they are used in specific use cases. Um, do modern drones give out any radio or other signals that affect satellite dishes or telephone comms? Um, drones do use uh, radio frequencies for communications, but they are on different frequencies to satellite dishes and telephone communications. It's more likely the other way around uh, that the, uh, the downlink can be affected if the output of, uh, say, a microwave dish or something like that is very strong and very close. But no, the drone itself should not affect your satellite dish or your communications devices. Is there any Excellent. other questions before we finish? I think we've got 30 seconds, have we, <laughs> Charlotte? Um, well, yeah, I can't, um, there's something about, is there a suitably licensed and experienced drone survey providers in the local area we operate in? We're in Plymouth. Yeah, EK Digital. <laughs> EK Digital, we cover from the Highlands of Scotland all the way down yeah. to Cornwall, including Wales and Northern Ireland. So, you know, we're able to. Otherwise, if you want to find someone else, uh, you can Google it and ask the questions. Um, we also have a some other operators that we work quite closely with and if they're more suitable than us we would recommend them um also if a drone isn't suitable we'll always tell you if a drone isn't suitable because we'd rather develop long-term relationships with people based on knowledge than just you know go ahead and do a job with the drone i think what we haven't touched on very quickly is a final i guess it's a shameless sales pitch but it's not um is that it's all very well getting the drone surveys undertaken but somebody needs to interpret that information i think that's where you know the benefit with Earl kendrick and adam joining forces is that we get the drone footage but we can apply that in the context of the managed residential sector so mm -hmm. you know applying well this is what we've seen you know now what does it mean for you and how do we manage that within the regulations of, of the sector so comes back to the fact that the drone is just a tool for getting information mm -hmm. it's all well and good being able to fly a drone but it's understanding what the information is that you're gathering and why it's being gathered and what what's the use of it um well excellent 
Yeah. Thank you so much, both of you, for Thanks a everyone. really, really, really interesting session. I think it's given a lot of food for thought for everybody. Um, we're going to be back later this afternoon with Roger Levitt at two o'clock to discuss mediation. Um, we'll send all your details to everyone who's joined this session today, yeah. so they'll be able to see your presentation. And also, if anybody wants to contact you, regarding your session um they will be able to do so once again thank you very much indeed both of you thanks everyone thank you very much nice and just to, to say you. thank you just to say there is an offer for anyone who was on the um on this cpd presentation that charlotte oh that's on the yeah no that's on the letter so don't worry I haven't forgotten brilliant thanks very much charlotte <laughs> thank you ever so much thank you bye-bye right.